Okay, so let's get the show on the road. If we um, were able to be here, say, about three or four hundred years ago, this is what we would see um, in this part of Auckland. The, um, the present Devonport Wharf would be about here now, I guess. Um, you can see Mount Victoria and Mount Cambria, North Head, and obviously the very young, fresh-looking um, Ringitoto in, in the background there. But unfortunately, we need to be Doctor Who or somebody and have a time machine to do that. But we'll come back to the, the time machine thing a bit later on. I really um, love old maps, um, partly from because of their uh, artistic point of view, partly, partly because of their historical significance, significance and what they can tell you about uh, what used to be there, and what has changed through time. Um, and old maps are, are a fantastic resource for, uh, for all sorts of reasons. So it's, the old saying, a picture speaks a thousand words, um, goes even further when you're looking at a map. Just zooming in on that particular map, which is from 1853, um, it was drawn mostly by naval, British naval um, people, and probably mostly drawn from the sea or from small boats, perhaps up the mast of a, of a, of a um, large sailing ship or something. So you can forgive them for getting a few things wrong from that perspective because they probably didn't really get on land to have a good look around. But they got, a, got quite a few things right. Um, you can see, oh, sorry, I have to go back now. You can see um, they got Three Kings volcano here, quite well done. Not so good on Mangaree Mountain, perhaps. Um, Pukki Tutu is not too bad. One Tree Hill, not a very good job on that one. <laughs> um, so, so it's a little bit, bit, bit of a mixed bag. But anyway, it's a fantastic, fantastic result. I've recently used this bit of coastline here in a paper I've written um, looking at the historical changes in that part of, the, part of the coastline over the last 150, 200 years or so. So they, they are an amazing resource. So, so I'm going to have a look at a few historical maps. And this is um, a very famous map of Auckland um, compiled by Ferdinand von Hochstetter. Hochstetter's geology of, of Auckland, and we're going to come back to this, this map a bit later on. But, but this map has got uh, an incredible amount of historical information, as well as geological information, and, um, and information about landforms that we can hardly, hardly see anymore in, in Auckland. And you can see all the, all the red scoria cones dotted around the place, and in a big sort of ellipse, which, which um, outlines the Auckland volcanic field, and of course the big blob up here, Ringitoto, the youngest in the field. Oldest volcanoes in the field would be things like Onipoto, uh, Tank Farm, and Pukeki down here, which should go back about 250,000 years. So it's quite a long-lived volcanic field. So if we zoom in on, on this map, just again sort of referring back to sort of historical things, it's, it's got a lot of information which um, I find quite interesting. I always um, wondered why in the Green Lane area there was a, it was called the Harp of Erin, and, and now I know it was named after a pub. So the, the, the Harp pub used to be there. Obviously, it's not there anymore. Um, and we'll zoom in on some of these other areas over here later on. But, but just little things um, like over here on the North Shore, there's, you've got Mount Victoria, you've got North Head, and you've got this one here, which is actually called Heafy Hill in this map. Mount Cambria, of course, is now pretty much gone, but um, it's no longer called Heafy Hill. This might be a bit of a nod by Hochstetter to his, his colleague Heafy, which that relationship I'll come back to later on as well. So the other interesting thing is, is that you can see that the surveys were done by Stokes and Drury. They're both quite famous. Drury, the township near Auckland, is obviously named after Drury. Um, and they were naval people, so they did all the coastline stuff and maybe some of the topographic stuff. And Hochstetter did all the, all the geological stuff. Um, interesting things like the German mile is quite big compared to the English mile. <laughs> so all that kind of interesting things. Um, and why do we have this meridian here? showing a, le a longitude from Paris. Whereas on the bottom of the map, the longitude is given from Greenwich. You can come back to, the, the, to me with that with late, later on, perhaps, or um, ask me about it later on. So we step forward a um, hundred years or so. And um, well, obviously, there are many, many maps in between. But skipping forward to this, this one here from 1941, um, part of the Auckland area. You've got the Upper Manukau Harbour here and the Tamaki Estuary, of course. You've got Mount Wellington here, Pamir Basin and so on. Um, and you can see Auckland was a much nicer place in those days. <laughs> there were a lot less um, coverage of roads and houses and things. And all this, a lot of this area over here was probably still farmland or semi-rural uh, at, at the most. Um, and you can still vaguely make out things called topographic contours. You see these squiggly lines 
not very well seen on this diagram. Squiggly lines going around the hillsides and a few over here on the flat lying areas. Contours are very, very useful things um, for geologists and geographers. They, they, at a glance, if you know what you're looking at, you can tell exactly what's going on with the landscape. So that this, you can still see contours, which is useful on this map, but you'll see from the next map, whoops, we've um, obliterated the landscape with urban development. This is Auckland today, pretty much. And you can see just about every surface is covered by concrete, tar seal, tin, or goodness knows what else. Um, and it's getting, getting awfully hard to see what's going on under that cover. But we're going to try and, try and find some tools to do that. So this is a geological map of Auckland, just a very small part of a, a 1992 geological map of Auckland by Les Commode. Um, and again, interestingly, you see that Les has left all the roads and stuff on, which is, kind of gets in the way of the, the geology in a way, but I can sort of see why he did it, so that people could reference the various geological um, features. So this is um, Wiri Volcano, or, or Manumiri Volcano, as it's called here, um, uh, Waitemokia, Mangere Mountain, uh, um, Robertson's Hill, and so on. And you can see that very clearly which is volcanic and which is not. So the, the yellow stuff is um, probably has a bit of volcanic ash over the top, but it's mostly younger, uh, sorry, slightly older uh, sediments. And you can see the airport sticking out there as a, as, a, as a modern anthropogenic geological feature, if you like, completely constructed. But the, the geological map is also has a lot of information apart from geology. Right, I just want to touch briefly on this, these two guys. Um, because they, they're kind of controversial, or they were controversial even at the, at, at, in their own time. Um, Ferdinand von Hochstetter over here um, is rightly called the father of geology in New Zealand. He was a, a German, a lot of people say he's Austrian, but he was actually German, um, who was, came to New Zealand as part of the Navarra expedition, an Austrian expedition sent by the Emperor of Austria uh, in the 1850s. And um, you can see he's holding his geology hammer which is very important in those days. If you were a Victorian person, you had to be holding something, obviously. This guy's holding his sword. Um, <laughs> Charles Heafy was a, a surveyor and um, a landscape artist and, and many other explorer and many other things as well. Um, and he's holding a sword because he was uh, in, the, in the military at that time as well. And he's wearing his um, Victoria Cross, which was, I believe he was the first New Zealand to win a Victoria Cross. However, I have to say it's a little bit dubious because he actually nominated himself for the Victoria Cross, I'm told, <laughs> um, which is fairly unusual, I would have thought, but, but it may be, give you some insight into the character of the guy, but that's just my biased opinion. Anyway, there's a, there's a little um, controversy between these two guys because in the next slide, we have two maps of Auckland's geology, one published by Heafy in about 1957, 59, it was slightly updated, I guess, and Hochstetter's map a little bit later after he returned to Austria and obviously a period of time sorting all his gear out and sorting all his specimens out, he published this map in 1865, but it actually dates from work that he did back in 1859. He and Hefe were colleagues, they collaborated together, they actually presented a public lecture in Auckland together um, where they, they shared their information. Um, and then things went a bit pear-shaped because Hefe, um jumped the gun and published his, his information without consulting Hochstetter. Hochstetter was still in New Zealand at the time when Hefe sent his information away to the um, Royal Society in Britain to publish his, his paper. But for some reason, he didn't bother to talk to, to Hochstetter about it um, and published without his knowledge, although he did acknowledge Hochstetter's co uh, contribution, but he never talked to Hochstetter. But Hochstetter was still here when that stuff went away. I don't know why he didn't talk to Hochstetter, but he should have. And meanwhile, Hochstetter, of course, <coughs> got the, the pip, um, when he heard about this, and did not acknowledge Hefe at all when he published his stuff later on. As these damn Germans, you know, they're so finicky. Um, but anyway, I think in this case, Hochstetter had every right to be annoyed. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that his is the greater work, and that Hefe is probably the plagiarist, rather than Hochstetter being the plagiarist. So. Anyway, we'll leave it at that. But they're both interesting maps, they both say different things, but this one clearly is... Um, the better in all sorts of ways. So, but Hochschild didn't, didn't get everything right. Um, this is just zooming in on part of his map. He did make mistakes, um, but that's, that's part, of, part of science. There are a few things on here which are not correct. He, for instance, put these little scoria cones here on Bolton Hills, which is near Mangere Mountain here. Um, they, they don't exist. That, well, they're not, they're not volcanic cones. There's very little evidence to suggest they're volcanic cones. There's some of these explosion craters here should not be here. 
Uh, there's another one here, which is not real either. But this area was probably reasonably inaccessible, being rather swampy, overgrown, sc thick scrub, goodness knows what. And he, he was in New Zealand for a, a very, very short space of time, when you think about all the things he did in the space of nine months or so. So if we look at this map, um, which is the modern equivalent, I guess, of Hochstetter's map, not a hell of a lot has changed, really. Um, 150 years later of research and work by dozens of people have not really um, substantially changed what Hochstetter had, had to say back in 1865. Hochstetter and Hefe, I should say. Um, obviously, there's been a few additions and a few sub subtractions, but the, the, the general geology um, is, is very much the same. And that's a real credit to Hochstetter, as I say, who, probably, who had a very short space of time in Auckland. He went, then went off down the Waikato River, well, up the Waikato River, I say, as far as Taupo, then across the Rotorua and back, back to Auckland, and a very big, long traverse, all by foot, all on foot, through very rough terrain. And then he spent a, another considerable period of time in, in northwest Nelson doing similar things, very r rigorous and robust fieldwork, which most of us today would drop dead even thinking about. Okay, so th this is the, the modern map, and you can see all the, um, all the various scoria cones in red, the, the explosion craters um, in the sort of um, greeny-brown colour, and, um, and the lava flows are the, the more sort of orangey-brown colour everywhere, and you can see Rangitoto has got an awful lot of lava, as you can see there. Okay, so how can we, how can we get a better handle on what's under, <clears throat> under Auckland? There's all sorts of different tools available these days to help us, um, and this is um, one of those sort of things that's out there on the web. You can find it if you want to. Um, this is a, a DEM, a digital elevation model of the Auckland region. You can see some little bumps here, which are obviously all the scoria cones. There's Mount Eden there, Mount Wellington, uh, Mangere Mountain, and even down here in the South Auckland volcanic field near Pukekohe, we can see some of the larger, um, uh, there's a large crater there. That's probably Pukekohe, Pukekohe volcano itself there. There's another explosion crater there, and so on. You can see this is an older equivalent of the Auckland volcanic field in, in the South Auckland or Franklin volcanic field, um, where all our fruit and veggies and all that sort of yummy stuff come from. Um, and you can see some very big faults going through. This is the Drury Fault going through, offsetting the Greywicki from the uh, young material over here, and also some many, many other big faults going through the, uh, going through the Hunuas here and out across the landscape. Really, really interesting stuff to, to have a look at and interpret. But we're also fortunate these days, of course, living at a time when we have all this kind of technology to play with. Um, this is the shuttle over Marlborough Sounds. This is Wellington here, Cook Strait. Um, and here's the boys having a lot of fun over New Zealand somewhere, uh, <laughs> doing whatever they do in, uh, up there. But the, these kinds of craft and all the satellites whizzing around above us give us lots of, um, lots of information that we can, we can usefully use. So I guess you're all familiar with Google Map. Don't confuse it with Google Earth. You can do a lot more things with Google Earth than you can, you can do with Google, Google um, Maps. Um, it's worth downloading Google Earth because it's got a few little tools and things you can play with. Um, but I guess most of you, would, if you have a computer and you have access to the web, would have had a go with, uh, with Google Map. You can spend hours entertaining yourself on Google Map. So these are some, some um, shots from Google Earth. Using, the, using that system. Um, and this is a view of um, Mount Wellington here in Auckland. And you can see where the, the quarry used to be here. And obviously, it, this, this is a fairly recent photograph from, it says 2002, but I think it might be later than that, 2009 perhaps. Um, and you can see that the, the old quarry site is being uh, infilled with all the um, Stonefields housing development that's gone in there since. Um, so that's. One view of Mount Wellington, you can quickly, quickly get off um, of Google Map, Google Earth, sorry, and you can play around and zoom in and out and do all sorts of things. Obviously, you can measure, th measure things up here. There's various tools. You can measure distances and play around with the sun angle and, and have a great time. Um, but the other nice thing about Google Earth is that you can tilt and rotate and fly through the landscape. So this is Mount Wellington um, viewed from an angle. And uh, this is using the time scale up here. You can move backwards and forwards in time. This is, the, this is our time machine now, or one of our time machines. And you can move from one view to another based on what satellite information is available from going back in time and sometimes even, even earlier from uh, aerial photo photography as well. Um, so you can see now, the, this is prior, before the previous one. You can see the, the changes um, that happened in the previous slide. This is still a quarry 
things are still going on in here. This big water reservoir here. They're still extracting uh, rock, basically. So this is prior to that time. This is an old quarry scar here on the side of Mount Wellington as well. And you can also clearly see the water reservoir uh, embedded into the top of Mount Wellington. Not very, not very well embedded, I might add. Um, yeah, and you can also see, I think, that... Uh, sort of. You can just see it's disappeared now. This, this, is, this was another volcano just here called Purchase Hill, which has been almost completely quarried away. The last little bit, which is still there, is that little knob right there. And you can see the explosion crater of Mount Wellington going around there. So another view going forward in time this now. So you can see the changes immediately using Google Earth. It's, this is the housing development stage. It's even more advanced now, obviously. And you can tilt and rotate, and you can see they've put in a new car park over here, and they've done this and they've done that. So you can track changes in your neighborhood quite, quite nicely, see what's going on. And this is a view of um, One Tree Hill. Um, so you can play around with One Tree Hill, which is a nice big blob. It's got lots of topography on it. You can look at all sorts of things. You can look at the lovely breached crater here coming out from One Tree Hill. There's another one going off in that direction. So you can rotate the whole thing and look around at One Tree Hill from all different directions. Um, you can um, figure out whose car is in the car park. No, not really. But, um, <laughs> but you can see all sorts of features uh, from using Google, Google Maps. Unfortunately, it seems for some reason that Rangitoto has been is not very well covered. It's got a, a, a missing data through, the, through Rangitoto there. But, um, but you can do that for anywhere in, in New Zealand, basically. And again, you can have a lot of fun. But I wonder how many of you have used this um, online tool. Has anybody used this one? Somebody has? Yeah. To look at um, topography or look up your, your rating information? Rating information. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, which, which you can do. It's got, this, is, this is probably the place to go if you want to spy on your neighbours. Because um, you just put in an address and you can find out how much they pay in rates and um, how much your land is worth compared to theirs and things like that. Um, <laughs> but it, as you can see, it only covers the Auckland region. But it, nevertheless, it's a fantastic tool. But I, li I like to, to play with it for, for another reason based on the, the map content and you can do all sorts of interesting things with, with that. But it's totally free. We shouldn't give the credit for it to the Auckland Council. Um, it was actually uh, put in place by the Auckland Regional Council, and the super city had nothing to do with it, so they've, they've now taken it over, obviously, but it was, a, it was available previ previously under the Auckland Regional Council, although not very well advertised. Um, so this is a, the standard view you'd come in on um, when you use this system after you've agreed to their terms and conditions, which nobody ever reads. Um, <laughs> but you can get all sorts of stuff about rate summaries and do searches of properties and various things. But this is the folder that I want to, to use most today, the, 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 uh, the map content folder. Okay, so when you open that folder, you've got a whole heap of things that you probably don't want to know about, but you can find about, about sewerage and um, um, stormwater and all sorts of other things. But the, the, the one to look at, first of all, is to click on and off these ones, but also, more importantly, to click on the View Layers button here, because it'll, it'll, it'll enable you to turn on and off different layers which relate to, to the, um, the map content more easily. So we'll do that and see what happens. So I've gone into that, that um, map content um, window, and I've switched off the, uh, base, the base map one. So it's removed all those nuisance roads, houses, streets, that sort of stuff. It's removed all that rubbish. Um, and now we're starting to see some, some interesting um, geological and uh, geographic and geomorphologic information about, about what lies under all that stuff. Unfortunately, you can't get rid of the green um, for public parks and domains and things, but that's okay. We can live with that. Um, but already you can see quite clearly some of the volcanic centers around the place. Um, even, well, not that one, actually not very well, but <laughs> you can see, um, now it's hiding behind there, but you can see Mount Wanita and some of the other bigger bumps. So that's that layer done. And then, um, then what you can do is click on the, the uh, contours layer, as I've done here, and then things start to get really interesting um, once the contours layer is turned on. And contours are very easy to read once you get your eye into them. You just have to pick a number, um, a contour layer, like this one here is 100, so it's 100 meters and just follow it around, and if everything at, at, around that contour is at the same height. If the numbers increase, you're going up a hill. If the numbers decrease, you're going downhill. So it's quite quick and easy to find out whether you're looking at a valley or, or a hill or a ridge or, or whatever once you get your eye in. So let's 
have a look at some of this um, contour information and see what, I, see what it can tell us. So I'm going to zoom in on this feature. I'm not going to tell you what it is. And I want you to tell me if you know what that, that feature is in Auckland. One Tree Hill, it's too easy, yes. Okay, um, either that or you've been on a, a geological tour there sometime. <laughs> but yes, it is One Tree Hill, and it's, it's a very distinctive landform because it has these big incised pockets into the, into the side of it. It has multiple scoria cones and craters. Um, it obviously has a big clear public park boundary as well. Um, but these are, these are the breached craters on One Tree Hill, which have, um, where the scoria cone uh, the crater in the scoria cone has, has ruptured or failed and the lava has flowed out, breaching the wall of the, of the crater, this one here as well. There's a big crater in here. This is the place where the, the um, One Tree Hill monument is there and so on. So you can get, a, you can get an awful lot of information. You keep, you keep zooming in to, I think it's one meter contour interval, so you can get quite a lot of detail. Um, uh, and you can very quickly discern what is man-made and what is, um, what is produced by nature once you start looking around. Okay. So that was an easy one. <laughs> so where is this feature? I'll give you a clue. Uh, two clues. Well, there's a major shopping center nearby, and that shopping center is built where there used to be some American warehouses during the Second World War. Where they had supply systems, yeah? Sylvia Park. Park, yes, close by, yeah, but so what's this thing called? No, it's not Mount Wellington. Mount Wellington is, is that way. Close, sir. Not Mount Richmond. <laughs> Sorry? Hamlin's Hill. Hamlin's Hill. Very good, yes. I used, to go, I used to work at the freezing work somewhere about here. Um, but yeah, it looks like a volcano, but it's not. So it's a good example of don't be deceived by something having <laughs> contours that look like a volcano. In fact, it, it, um, it was mapped wrongly by some early geologist as, as a volcano, but it's not a volcano. It's actually a lump of um, white matter sandstone or Miocene, Miocene sediments. So, um, yeah, you, you can see it's got some lovely contours and you can follow the contours around, but this is, this is not a scoria cone. This is not a breached crater, um, and that's not another scoria cone. That's not another breached crater. So you have to be a little bit careful about interpreting the, the, uh, the maps. But that's, a, that's a, a nice example of contours nonetheless. And this, you can see the man-made features very clearly. This is the southern motorway going through here. Okay, you can see those, those changes in the contours show you where the motorway is. This is a, a road going through here as well. There's a bridge there obviously, hopefully. Hopefully there's a bridge there. Um, <laughs> and so on, and so on and so forth. So you can see all the modifications going on. All right, so, well, that, give that man up there a chocolate fish. For, um, so here's, here's Hamlin's Hill, and here's, here's Sylvia Park over here somewhere, I guess. Yep, there's a station, so it must be there somewhere. And here's Mount Richmond, where we're going to go next. Uh, and there's Mount Smart, or what's left of Mount Smart. There's not much left of it now. So let's have a look at um, Mount Richmond. And a very, another very interesting volcano, if you ever get a chance to go in there and have a look around. It's got a lot of um, scoria cones, breach craters, a, a lot of interesting features. A lot of well-established trees, so it's a little bit hard to, to uh, find your way around, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it's well worth a visit. And you can sort of make out the explosion crater. We'll talk a bit more about that sort of geological thing later on, but the explosion crater going around here. But what the hell's going on over here? Something strange. Doot, 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 doot. Contours are going. This is a bit of a bump. What's the bump? This is where we get our time machine from using, using this map viewer, and it's really, really good. So we've got that picture. Let's have a look at the terrain model. Shows you, take away the contours, this is the terrain underneath. You can still see what's going on here to a certain extent at Mount Richmond, but you still have really got no idea what's happened over here. There's a big hole. How did that, what happened? What's that, what are these things here doing? There's the southern motorway. You can see that coming through, coming along there. Okay, so here's the picture we have today of this area. Um, so here's, um, so this is where we've got our time machine. We've got this um, slider here. We can move it backwards or forwards in time, back to 1940, as you can see, which is a bit further back than we've done previously. And you can do different time steps in between. So here's, here's Mount Richmond. We can see all these changes over here, which what the hell does that mean? We've got all this going on over here where there's funny zigzag lines where what does that mean? And here's this other motorway chopping through everything as well. So what I'm gonna do is move that slider to the left and go back to 1940. And Let's see the difference. 
Okay? Hello, we've lost the motorway. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice to lose all those damn motorways? Um, but this was, this is 1940, and it's obviously a very different landscape. We've got this beautiful um, view, aerial pho photographic view of Mount Richmond with all its scoria cones and craters. Um, and we've got this thing suddenly appears. Where the hell did that come from? We've, we've got these lovely craters, multiple scoria cones. We've got all the archaeology that are here. This is a, a volcano called McLennan Hills. And you, you, would, you go past it every time you go down the southern motorway. But I would guarantee that 99.9% .9 of Aucklanders don't even know it exists. You can see some of the lava flows actually as you go through there. But, uh, and especially near Tip Top Corner as well, you can see some of the lava flows. There were very expensive lava flows going out towards the uh, Tamaki Estuary over here. So this has all been highly quarried away, modified, destroyed. Um, and it was there in the 1940s, but we've lost it since. You can see beautifully also on this aerial the outline of the explosion crater for Mount Richmond. See this hole here? is the explosion crater for Mount Richmond. We'll talk about explosion craters in a minute. We're, we're standing on a, an explosion crater rim as I speak. So, next slide. I'm just going to go jump forward about um, 20 years to 1959. And you can already see that everything's gone crazy over here. They've pretty much quarried all those lovely things away already. All the houses have gone in. The motorway's here. Whoops. Um, and you can see they're already starting to modify things over here as well. So Mount Richmond itself is being impacted by what's going on. And then if we jump to today, well, you know, it's just, um, you can't see anything really. So there's our time machine, and we've used the contours and this, and we can find out all sorts of stuff about what happened in Auckland. Okay, so this is um, where we are now, and I won't talk too much about this, this diagram. Um, this map, sorry, but you can see I've superimposed here the, um, the contours on top of the satellite imagery. Um, and you can see there's something going on here around the domain. We are somewhere here at the moment. Uh, you've got this little bump in the middle. It's a little bit hard to figure out what's going on over here. We've got Grafton Gully going off down here. Um, and we've got a lot of very steep topography over here in, in Parnell. Um, so, yeah. So we've got this feature running around here, which is quite interesting, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I want to finish with this slide, going back in history <laughs> again. I'm sorry, I really do love the historical stuff. And zoom in on this part of Hochstetter's map from uh, 1865, 1859. Um, and we are here. And you can see that Hochstetter clearly identified um, several volcanoes in the domains area. He identified the domain volcano which for some reason he didn't draw very well. <clears throat> I'm, I'm puzzled about that. Maybe it was an access problem. Um, it was the home of the, um, the later Maori king, um, Te Whera Whera. Um, But it's a little bit puzzling why he didn't draw it very well, because he was actually staying quite close in, in downtown Auckland at the time. But he also clearly identifies Grafton Volcano, which we've been sort of led by the, the media to believe is, is a new volcano, but 150 years ago or, so, or more, Hochstetter clearly had an idea that something was going on there. It's a little bit askew perhaps with these bumps here, which are up towards the upper part of Cabo Pass, but there have been other geologists who've speculated that there's something going on up there um, volcanogenic or volcanologically. Um, but it may, they may be just simply looking at very thick ash deposits from, from this volcano or from the domain volcano, but we don't, we don't have enough information to really make an assessment on that. But the other really interesting thing, going back to this historical stuff, is we've got another pub here. The Royal George, <laughs> okay, which I don't know if it's still called, is there still a Royal George in Newmarket? There might be in, in Broadway. But you've got like, really nice things like windmills. There used to be a windmill here in Upper Queen Street, Crangapi Road, Simon Street area. And what's this thing here? Anybody know what that feature is, that octagonal thing? Barracks. That's the Elwood Park Barracks, yep, which was a, a major military defensive position uh, at this time. And that's the Albert Park volcano, of course, they're one of the oldest in Auckland. We don't really have an age on that, unfortunately. So, yeah, it's just we need to pay due respect to um, old maps, new maps, satellite maps, all the data we can, and we, then we can, we can interpret and, and um, have a bit more of a time machine and see what was going on in the past. In one way, you could think of um, the Auckland volcanic field as the volcano, and these little bumps in, in that elliptical field are uh, eruptions from time to time within that volcano. But... Strictly speaking, volcanologists call each individual eruption a new volcano, but the field has a lifespan equivalent to 
um, the lifespan of, say, the Ruapehu Narahui area. Ruapehu is a, is a similar sort of lifespan, and some of those large volcanoes have um, very long lifespans, but the Auckland Volcanic Field has a quite a long lifespan if you go through its, through its um, history. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit semantic whether you call the field, the Auckland Volcanic Field, a volcano, or whether you call each individual eruption of it. But this is a basaltic volcanic field, which is a particular kind of magma, um, which behaves differently to the, the Ruapehu Narahui type volcanoes, or the, or the Mount Egmont Taranaki volcano, or um, Taupo, which is rhyolitic. So each different magma type produces a different kind of volcano. But on a hazard level, um, the Auckland vol volcanoes like Mount Eden or um, uh, One Tree Hill or something like that are really little pimples, aren't they, on a scale of uh, volcanic eruptions. They're little tiny things. I personally think it would be great if we had another eruption. It would be a great tourist attraction. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to evacuate a five-kilometre zone, but um, that's okay. Well, in terms of fields, yes, you're right. The, the, the uh, Pukekohe Franklin Field is a precursor um, or direct ancestor of the Auckland field, and then the Auckland field is younger equivalent to that. Yeah, the volcanologists don't like to predict where the next, next eruption might want to occur. When they run, when they run scenarios for um, emergency services testing purposes, they usually put them in places like um, in the middle of the Manukau Harbour or somewhere else. But um, they don't really have much of an idea of where, they, where it will pop up. They do have an array of um, seismographs around Auckland, which they hope to use to detect where the next eruption might occur if it, it does start to take off because they, can, they, can, they, they theorise that they can detect volcanic quakes or volcano quakes as the magma rises up through the crust. So each um, Auckland volcano, like Mount Eden, Mount, Mount Wellington, has only erupted once and then that's end of, it's finished. The field, the volcanic field, is not extinct. It's, it's merely dormant because um, we know Rangitoto was only 650 years ago. Um, so the next eruption could be anywhere from now to 10,000, 15,000 years. We don't really... You, know, you can't play a sort of a Sky City game on these things. Um, but, um, yeah, so it's is it is an active volcanic field, the, the Auckland volcanic field as a whole, but each individual um, eruption centre is considered to be dead or extinct. The, the theory being that when, when these things fight their way to the surface, and they have a hard, hard enough job doing that anyway, creating a pathway for the, the magma to, to rise to the surface, when they've finished and, and um, everything's over for that particular eruption cycle, the conduit is blocked by solid magma, and it's, it's extremely hard for another a batch of magma to find its way back up the same pathway, so it has to find a new, new place. So if you're living on or near an existing um, eruption, a scoria cone or volcano, you're probably quite good. it's probably quite a good place to live. If you're living somewhere where there's a bit of a gap, <laughs> then that could be the next, uh, that could be the next eruption. Yeah. You can all see this big rim going all the way around. We're standing on part of it here. It goes way around there. You can see it going up. Um, over near Carlton Gore Road, past the grandstand, back around. So we're, there's a big bowl here, okay? And, and the museum is perched on one, one part of that, um, that rim going all the way around. And that's the um, explosion crater um, initial phase of this, of this volcano forming um, we're standing on now. And uh, I'll talk more about that when we look at it from the other side, from the little bump in the middle, and how, how it relates to... Um, to what's going on in this in this area. So we were standing over there just on the, the rim of the explosion crater before and um, a typical Auckland volcano has up to three three phases. They don't all behave the same way, they don't all do the same thing, um, but this one has pretty much done all three except the third one, third phase is probably a, possibly a bit of a fizzer. Um, but the first phase it did extremely well which was the, the formation of the explosion crater. And that's the, that's the time when you want to be furthest away. Okay, so you want to be probably about five kilometers away, somewhere around there, uh, maybe even further. <laughs> because at this time, the, the volcano is acting in its, its, in its most bad-tempered, violent way. The reason being, you've got uh, extremely hot magma coming to the surface. It's at about 1,000 degrees plus. It's also extremely rich in gas, uh, dissolved gases. And it comes into contact with stuff which is cold and usually wet. And th something that's very hot, gas rich, does not behave very well when it comes into contact. I'm, I'm just the same myself. Um, when it comes into contact with something that's wet and, wet and, uh, and cold. So they, they, they react explosively and you get a very, quite a large explosion crater formed, um, which is quite a common feature of many Auckland volcanoes. I mean, Panmure Basin, Oreki Basin, only Poto. You'll see quite a few explosion craters. Most Aucklanders think they're some kind of lake, which they are. 
but they don't realize they were actually formed initially um, by, by a volcanic eruption. Okay, so I was saying that that, that um, interaction causes uh, the fragmentation of most of the material into quite small bits. And this is a very freshly collected piece of um, tuff, or some people say tuff, which I just stole from just down over there on my way here this afternoon. And I'll pass it around. You can see it looks a bit like a sandstone. And the, the light color suggests that it's mostly made up of frag fragmented uh, country rock, which in this case below us would be water matter sandstones and siltstones. Um, but that's what the tuff looks like, and that's what's making up most of that rim over there, okay? Layer upon layer of this kind of material, you can see it's quite layered. Um, fragmental tuff. It can become quite hard and indurated and be quite hard to, to dig into, but, but often it's uh, reasonably soft, sort of friable material. But that's the kind of material that the tuff, tuff ring is, is made of, and that's the kind of material that, that buried um, and, and knocked down and wiped out the totra trees that one of the other gentlemen was talking about before that were dated. Um, we, had it, we had sent away to be, to be radiocarbon dated from this site when the, uh, the, the, the Blind Institute was doing their foundations over there. And unfortunately for us, the, the date on that material, on that wood, which was is, which is very fresh, you could just about build a table out of it, um, was beyond 50,000 years. So it was beyond, basically beyond radiocarbon dating. So we know that this volcano is quite old, but we don't know, quite know how old. The, the, the preservation of it suggests that it's, it's old as well, because this, this feature here is quite weathered. Um, the tuff ring is quite weathered as well, but that really only gives you an approximation of, of how, old it, how old it would be. So it's probably maybe 50 to 100,000 years old, but that's a guess. There has been some other drilling down here in the playing fields, which also confirms that sort of thing based on other, other evidence, but they don't, they don't have a good fix on its age. Okay, so we have that explosion crater phase being, being formed, and sometimes that's it. That's the end of the, end of the eruption. The volcano just shuts down. So that's your Panmure Basin, your Oriki Basin type thing, and there's no more activity. They don't go to phase two. If there's um, more magma available coming up the, the conduit, um, that, that, um, that magma will be, still be gas rich, still be very hot, but at this stage the, the ground conditions around the volcano have dried out, so it's a dry eruption, and you'll just get fire fountaining, uh, bombs, and the building of scoria cones, maybe a bit of, bit of lava, but mostly sort of fire fountaining scoria cone building phase at, at that time, that's, that's phase two. So that's your typical, what everybody knows is a volcano around Auckland, it's your Mount Talbots, your Mount Edens, your Mount Wellingtons and so on. Um, and that's what we all identify, and that's what makes, makes Auckland, you know, what it is. And so, I, of course, you all know that most of that material is, um, if I can feel and find the right one, is um, made of this stuff, very light, frothy, scoriaceous material, not just big chunks like this one, but also, um, also smaller pieces, but that's a typical piece of scoria, of course, very, very lightweight and very porous, um, but not permeable. Please, if your, your plumber or your drain layer or whatever says, oh, I'll get a truckload of scoria and mate to do that drain for you, tell them, no. They, they don't seem to realize that although it's got lots of holes, those holes aren't connected to each other. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's poor, it has a high porosity, but it's not permeable. So please ask them to just use good old fashioned grey wacky, because we've got plenty of grey wacky, um, but we've got very little of our volcanoes left. And if we, we don't take it from here, we take it from somebody else, it'll be up, up north or down south. Okay, so that's some of the stuff that gets chucked out, and that's very clinkery and rubbly, um, and produces the very steep sides, but we also get some other interesting things being chucked around at the same time. You could probably quite happily watch what's going on at this stage from a few hundred meters away, um, or less, but you'd want, to be, you'd want to be upwind, okay, because there'd be a lot of ash being chucked into the air, and you want to be upwind of that ash, otherwise you might need to um, take evasive action. But this is uh, a bomb, a small bomb. Um, I call it a dog turd bomb. Because you, you find them quite commonly where people walk their dogs. Um, but it was a piece of sort of semi molten lava that flew through the air, got a bit of a shape on it, and then ding in the ground and bent, bent the end of it. So that's a, a little bomb made from, made from basalt. And this is uh, a more of a, a spindle shaped bomb. So the piece of um, molten material has been chucked into the air and then spun slightly, giving it a sort of a pointy end, not quite symmetrical pointy ends, but that's a, a tiny little spindle bomb. And they get bigger, and this is a, still a small spindle bomb, but nonetheless more, perhaps more, um, more convincing. It has a nice spindle shape, it has a bit of flow-like features on each end, so that's, that's been chucked through. That one would certainly kill you. Um, that one, those ones probably would too, actually, but, but this one certainly would make a big dent. That's a, a spindle bomb. Um, and then you've, I mean, these things come in all sizes, of course, and, and you'll, you'll know if you've been through the galleries that there's a very big spindle bomb in the Auckland Museum galleries. And in a moment, we'll walk down over there and have a look at another big one as well from this place. But um, 
This is another type of bomb, it's a ribbon bomb. So in this case, a piece of um, lava, magma has been squirted through a crack or something. You can see the, the lines where, it be, where it's squirted through the crack. It's become a sort of a sheet-like thing and then been chucked into the air, become hardened and then landed again. So that's a, that's a uh, ribbon bomb. And what else have we got? Oh, we're running out of bombs. That's a hammer. Um, and the last one, which is, my, which, is, which is my favorite, these are quite rare, but they are kind of interesting. This is a, a cowpat bomb. Okay, so basically a piece of molten lava gets chucked into the air, lands on the ground, and goes splat. One of, the, one of these days I'm going to break it, but, but that's basically what they look like, and you can see where it gets the name from. So that's, a, that's a quite a rare, unusual, unusual bomb. So yeah, that's, that's the, uh, the scoria cone building phase, um, where you get some interesting things happening. We're standing on top of a scoria cone right here. This is uh, Pukekaroa, I believe. Um, so it's, it's like the castle inside the moat. They sometimes call these castle and moat volcanoes, but it's a little bit misleading because as far as I remember when I was in the UK looking at castles, the, uh, the moat was outside the wall, but uh, maybe they mean the explosion crater is the wall. Um, but the, that's one of their features. The, the Europeans call them Ma volcanoes, M-A-M-A-A-R. Um, but we're standing on top of the castle. And in this case, only one scoria cone, but sometimes multiple scoria cones. So like at Three Kings or other places. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a, a quite a safe place to be at this time, to watch this, this, the fire fountain and so on. This is the tourist attraction phase, by the way. Um, and then um, the next phase is something that a lot of them don't do, or they do, do it very badly, is the, is the lava flow phase. So at this, at this time, the, the magma has, is pretty much degassed but it's still very hot and still has a, a very low viscosity, of course. And that tends to generally, the lava flows tend, tend to push out of the base of the scoria cones. And in this case, probably just flowed into this surrounding area here inside the, the, uh, the castle walls, if you like, and, and formed a bit of a lava lake. Um, and they have this, there's some idea that the lava actually ponded in this area over here, but then decided to go back down the plug hole over there somewhere. So that's one reason why we have this sort of drop in topography over here is that the, the lava lake then receded back down again um, for, that, for, that, for that form there. But, um, so, but often the, the lava will escape um, beyond the scoria cones, beyond the, the, um, the crater, crater rim, or the scoria cone is built up over the, uh, and covered the, the, um, the uh, explosion crater, like at Mount Eden and other places. And then the lava flow just moves out passively below. And you get massive, massive lava flows. I mean, Mount Wellington had big outpourings of lava. Uh, Rangitoto, of course, is the sort of archetypal shield volcano with lava flows in all directions, forming the shield. One Tree Hill had big lava flows. So you get one, two, three phases, basically, depending on how the, how the magma is behaving at the time and what's going on. Um, right, very quickly, <clears throat> we'll go and have a look at the, the big bomb over there in a minute. But from here, we can also get a hint of what's going on. You'll have to believe me. <laughs> over there, there is another volcano beyond the grandstand and over there towards the medical school and so on called the Grafton Volcano. And the Grafton volcano was, was uh, in terms of time, slightly before the, the Domain volcano. We know there's not much of a time separation between the two, and the Domain volcano basically blasted its way through the Grafton volcano and obliterated part of the, part of the Grafton volcano. But there's a, a scoria mound over there called Outwaite Park, uh, which is the scoria cone of, of the Grafton volcano. And there's also other evidence within, from borehole logs and other things in the Grafton area showing big accumulations of lava and scoria and other things over there. So there's a second volcano completely buried under houses and everything else over there now. But if you, if you remember back to my talk, Hochstetter clearly thought there was something going on there when he was around and he, he had these two volcanoes, the Domain Volcano and the Grafton Volcano clearly shown on his, on his map as being, uh, being different entities. It's quite a complicated geology under Auckland, which I, which I won't go into, and it's quite an um, interesting story in itself. But there's a, there's a zone of weakness and, um, well, for want of a better word, crustal deformation below Auckland, which, which is why the Auckland volcanic field is probably where it is and why it's been where it is further south and then further south again through, through time. But it's not exactly crustal thinning, but it's, it's, a, it's a part of the crust which is uh, weaker, if I can use that word, and allows these magmas to get to the surface um, more easily.